So the uh, Holy Day season is going to begin here uh, in, in another week. Uh, we begin with the festival of Passover. It's uh, not actually a holy day, but it is, a, it is most definitely a festival and uh, is a reminder of something most significant. But it does seem that as we live in a world that is antagonistic to God, as you uh, look at uh, Satan and his efforts, Satan seeks to constantly undermine and, undermine and uh, uh, fight against uh, the Sabbath and the holy days and that kind of thing. And uh, sadly, as you look at the Passover, you have a number of different issues that surround the Passover. For those who were uh, here last year, we talked about when the Passover was killed. And we looked at uh, the scriptures in Exodus 12 and the meaning of certain wording, uh, which tells us that uh, the, Sabbath, the, the Passover was sacrificed uh, between the two evenings, it says in the uh, Bible, and uh, that is the time between sunset and dark. The time between sunset and dark at the beginning of the 14th day of the first month. And uh, so that's, uh, we, that's why we celebrate the Passover on Sunday evening. It is uh, between the two evenings there that we begin the Passover, and that uh, will t- take place on Sunday, e- Sunday night. We also looked at Israel's first Passover, and we looked at the reasons, some supportive reasons of why the Passover was at the beginning of the 14th. We saw that uh, the people of Israel made the sacrifice of the lamb between the two evenings, and they had the responsibility of roasting the lamb and eating it and, uh, and staying in their houses all night. Uh, they were to, uh, none of it, the uh, lamb was to remain until the next day. It was to be burned. Whatever was left was to be burned. And then the next morning, they went out to spoil the Egyptians. And um, then, they, then after they spoiled the Egyptians, they began, uh, some had a longer distance, some had a shorter distance to go uh, to Ramses and uh, be there by at that rendezvous point at Ramses at the end of the 14th to begin leaving Egypt after sunset on the 15th. So there's no way they could have eaten the Passover at the end of the 15th. Couldn't have been done. Wasn't enough time to do all of the things that they needed to, to, to do. So at the beginning of the 15th, they went out by night. And that is the beginning of the days of unleavened bread. They began their journey to the land of promise. And the, the beginning of that journey, the time that uh, God had broken the power of, of the Egyptians over them, the Egyptians were allowing them to leave, and that's why it's called a night to be much remembered, because we remember that God has set us free just as he set Israel free in order that we could, uh, they could make their journey to the land of promise and we could begin our journey uh, toward eternal life. An interesting study that we're not going to do this evening or today is, is how the Jews began to keep the Passover at the temple. As you look at what takes place in, in Exodus 12, no lambs were sacrificed at the temple because there wasn't a temple at that point. And you don't find any command to, to take the lambs to the temple and sacrifice them. But what you do find as you go through and examine the Old Testament, you find that from the time of, of when Israel came out of Egypt until the time of Hezek, King Hezekiah, there, was, there is no command to take any lambs to the tabernacle or the temple. They only began to take the lambs to the temple during the time of King Hezekiah. The reason for that was that Baal worship had become so pervasive and uh, Hezekiah and uh, the priest did not have confidence in the people to make the sacrifices in their own homes and so they uh, commanded them to bring the lambs up to the temple. So that process began in the time of Hezekiah. The scriptures show us that also uh, uh, the, the, during the time of Josiah they did the same thing. Uh, the king prior to Josiah was an evil king and that evil had, had spread throughout the nation. And Josiah said, we need to, again, bring the lambs up to the temple in order to sacrifice them. And uh, so this was not commanded by God in either case. This was something that the kings decided upon. Now, their intentions were good, but it was not something commanded by God. And it was during the reign of Josiah that the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread began to be merged. They began to be seen as one celebration. 
instead of two distinct celebrations, one celebration. When the temple was rebuilt in 515 BC after the captivity, Ezra held a temple Passover on the afternoon of the 14th. He was following the example of Hezekiah and Josiah. And the reason, there was a lot of confusion in the religious area in Jude, in, among the Jews at that particular time. And so Ezra issued a Passover law whereby all Jews would have to come down to Jerusalem to make, uh, to make the Passover sacrifice at the temple. And, uh, but some came down to do that, to observe the, uh, but some, uh, and uh, they did that, and uh, others kept the domestic, what would be called the domestic Passover. Uh, they may have come to Jerusalem, and, uh, but they sacrificed their lambs in, where, in the location they were staying. So from the time of Ezra, there were two Passovers being observed. Because what you see is Christ keeping the Passover at the beginning of the 14th, and you see a temple Passover also going on. So uh, we would call one of them the domestic Passover that was held in the homes as instructed in Exodus 12. And then you have what might be called the traditional Passover, a tradition of men or the Jews where they were sacrificing their lambs in the afternoon of Passover at the temple. From, from, and so this became a tradition. It was a tradition to eat the lambs at the beginning of the 15th rather than the 14th. Now, at the time of Christ, as I said, there were two Passovers being observed. One that Christ kept at the beginning of the 14th and the traditional Passover at the temple. So um, what's interesting, as you come to the time of Christ, a piece of unleavened bread was being called Passover by the Jews, as we'll see in Luke chapter 22, verse 1. So with that background, background in mind, we're going to take a look at the New Testament, and we're going to take a look at the differences between the commanded domestic Passover of Exodus 12 and compare that to, to the traditional pass, temple Passover of the Jews. Now, a lot, you know, if, for most of us, we didn't recognize any of this. We felt that sacrificing the lambs in the afternoon on the 15th was what God instructed, but that's not what he instructed at all when you really step back and think about it. So we're going to examine these two Passovers in the New Testament and see which one Christ sanctioned and which one he frustrated and abolished. Now, so I've entitled this sermon, The Passovers of the New Testament, and I say Passovers plural because we will see, as I said, there were two different Passovers. So what we're going to do is first begin by looking at some differences between the two Passovers. There are seven, seven differences between the domestic Passover and the temple Passover. Seven differences. Number one, in the original Passover of Exodus 12, God commanded Israel uh, in this Passover to kill the lambs at the beginning of the 14th, between the two evenings, between sunset and darkness. In the temple Passover, the lambs were killed at the end of the 14th. They were killed in the afternoon of the 14th. In the original Passover, number the second difference, in the original Passover, the lambs were killed at, their dwell, at the dwelling places of those making the sacrifice. In what became the traditional Passover of the Jews, the lambs were killed at the temple. One was done at home, one was done at the temple. Number three, in the original, the lambs were killed by the heads of the household or family. In what became the traditional Passover, the lambs were killed by the priest. Number four, in the original Passover, the blood was sprinkled on the doorpost of their dwellings. In the traditional Passover, the blood was sprinkled on the altar of the temple. Number five, in the original Passover, the lamb was eaten the night of the 14th. In what became the traditional Passover of the Jews, the lamb was eaten on the night of the 15th on the evening of the first day of unleavened bread. When we're celebrating the night to be observed, that's when they were eating the Passover. Number six, 
In the, original pass, the, in the original, the Passover commemorates the passing over of the houses of the Israelites by the death angel. What became the traditional Passover, the, the Jews, that all got confused. And the Jews today will tell you that the Passover commemorates the Exodus. Is that what the Passover commemorates? That is, that's confusing the Passover with the Exodus. It is the first day of unleavened bread that commemorates Israel coming out of Egypt or the Exodus. And this is why we observe the night to be observed at the beginning of the 15th. That's part of the days of unleavened bread, not Passover. Originally, the Passover and days of unleavened bread were two distinct festivals with two distinct meanings. One commemorating the passing over of the, the death angel and um, the other commemorating coming out of Egypt. As far as the traditional Passover of the Jews, that developed over time. Those two feasts became merged into one overall feast incorrectly called Passover, commemorating the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. So what happened over time is that the two merged. So you know, as you think about that, the Jews did not recognize Christ. And they had become, begun to converge the two holy days, or two festivals. Could that contribute to their not seeing Jesus Christ? So then, th these are seven major differences between the original domestic Passover of the Exodus 12 and what became the traditional Passover of the Jews. And both of those two Passovers were being observed at the time of Jesus Christ. Uh, the majority of the Jews, the common people, observed the domestic Passover at the beginning of the 14th, whereas the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and the religious leadership observed the traditional temple Passover at the end of the 14th, which they ate on the 15th. So with that in mind, let's examine the Passovers of the New Testament. Let's begin in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And what we'll find in Luke chapter 22 is how the Jews categorize, categorize the days of unleavened bread. Luke 22, verse 1. Luke 22, verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. The feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. So this, this verse shows us how the Jews categorized the days of unleavened bread. They called it Passover. So um, we can see what the viewpoint of the religious leadership of Christ's day was. And we can see how the two feasts had been merged into one feast called Passover. The Passover and unleavened bread are two distinct feasts, but by the time they had become, become merged in one overall feast. So with that understanding in mind, let's go back to and look at the Passovers that Christ kept during his uh, time in the, in the ministry. And uh, we'll, it wasn't all in the ministry, but let's go back to chapter 2. We're going to look at his, the first Passover that we're made aware of that Christ kept, Luke chapter 2. So we'll look at the ones that were involved during the time of his ministry, but we'll also look at this one that took place when he was a child. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. It tells us of Christ that he grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. So every year during Christ's childhood, through the whole time that he grew up and lived at home, he went up with his parents to keep the feast of Passover and the days of unleavened bread. Verse 42, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. They went up according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind, behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. So uh, Christ is there. He's uh, keeping the feast. And it speaks here of the, the phrase, the custom of the feast, the custom of the Passover. 
And this portion of the verse is important because it's used by those who support the Passover being at the beginning of the 15th. So they use this to say that Christ kept the Passover as did the rest of as did a portion of the Jews by and eating the sacrifice killing the lamb in the afternoon and eating it on the evening of the of the 15th. They're saying that this is what he was doing. It was his custom. He was following the custom of of the Passover. And uh, so is that true? Can you draw that conclusion from what we read here? The Greek word translated custom here is ethos, and it means as prescribed by law or by habit. And the law, what is the law on the Passover and when it should be observed? Where would you go to find instruction in that regard? Wouldn't you go to Exodus chapter 12? And as you go to Exodus chapter 12, it becomes clear that the feast was to be eat, was the sacrifice was to be done at the beginning of the 14th and to be eaten that night, not on the afternoon of the 15th. And who was the one who inspired those words? The very one who was the Passover lamb. So Christ's habit and the habit of Christ's parents was to obey all of God's laws and instructions. Jesus Christ never broke any of God's laws or instructions. So as Christ said in Matthew 5, verse 17, he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill them, which he did as being the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Christ knew that his purpose was to die for the sins of the world, to become the Passover lamb, slain from the foundation of the world, and Christ knew that he was to fulfill every aspect of the Passover as stipulated by Christ himself in Exodus 12. If that's the case, which Passover would Christ and his parents be keeping? They would be keeping the Passover of Exodus 12, as God instructed them, not the traditional Passover of the Jews. Again, the word translated custom does not mean traditional. It means as prescribed by law or by habit. And the law prescribed, keeping it at the beginning of the 14th, and it was the habit of Christ and his parents to keep it at that time. So um, the implication, when they finished observing the days, you know, it goes on to talk about that in chapter 2. They kept the Passover and they also observed the days. And what days were those? The days of unleavened bread. So, um, but I would add this, based on Luke 22, verse 1, in the minds of the Jews of that day, they would, would, the connotation would be that they, they had finished the days of Passover, not the days of unleavened bread. So because the days of unleavened bread and Passover were all lumped together and called Passover could mean the days of unleavened bread or it could also mean the day of Passover which included the Passover and days of unleavened bread. One clear thing is we can't use this to support the keeping of the Passover on the 15th. Can't do that. So we can clearly show what what Passover Christ observed. Now let's go to the Gospels and see what they have to tell us about this subject. And it's interesting, you'll see how John uses the wording regarding Passover. And he expresses it two different ways. Is there a reason why he expresses it one way and then another? Why would he make the distinction? So uh, we can't say absolutely that this is what it means, but it is interesting the way John expresses the Passover here in his book. Why does he use different terminology, as we'll see? Is he making a distinction? He's using words that would create a distinction. Let's go to John chapter 2, verse 13. John chapter 2, verse 13. Verse 13, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So he tells it, he calls it the Passover of the Jews. Is he referring to a Passover that's different from that which is commanded in Exodus chapter 12 and making that distinction? They had their Passover at the beginning of the 15th. 
Jesus is focusing on the Jews and something that was taking place at the temple. As it goes on to say here, it talks about the Passover of the Jews in verse 13. And then he go, in verse 14, it goes on to talk about what he found in the temple. He found that they, they sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing their business. And he, what did he do? He began to cleanse the temple. You see, the Jews had corrupted the use of the temple for what God's intention was. It was not to be a house used for merchandising, but that's what they had made it. And so he cleansed the temple at that time. So here John was uh, focusing on the Jews at the temple, and he called their Passover the Passover of the Jews, which to me is an interesting observation, which might be a reference to the traditional temple Passover sacrificed on the evening of the 14th and eaten on the 15th. Now, Christ was also in Jerusalem at that time to observe the original Passover, which John makes reference to in John chapter 2, verse 23. You notice in verse 13, he calls it the Passover of the Jews, but what does he call it in verse 13? Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. So, he uses different terminology there. Why? Uh, why would he do that? Is there a reason? So John is focusing on Christ and Christ being there to observe the Passover. He's not focusing on what the Jewish religious leadership was doing. So we can't make an ironclad case that John 2 verse 13 and John 2 23 are referring to two different Passovers, but it is interesting that he chose to use different words. Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the sea of, uh, sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because he, they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. So he, gives an, he goes on in uh, these verses to talk about uh, this different wording and to use that different wording. Going on to John chapter 11, it's John chapter 11 gives an account of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The raising of Lazarus from the dead, John chapter 11, verse 45. John chapter 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. So some had seen the re uh, Lazarus resurrected from the dead, saw the, Christ, the things that Christ were doing and believed in him. Other people went to the religious leadership and explained what they were seeing. And, um, and, uh, and they were uh, wondering about, about all of this. Verse 47, then the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. And so they see all of these signs taking place and people being swayed by Jesus Christ into believing in him and what he was teaching. Then let's go down to verse 53. Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country from near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So we come right up to the time when Jesus Christ is going to become the Passover lamb, and he speaks of the Passover of the Jews was near. And remember that John is focusing on the Pharisees and their desire to kill Christ, and he calls it the Passover of the Jews. And it also says many went up to Jerusalem before the Passover he uses different terminology. Why use different terminology? Notice that what he says in chapter 12, verse 1 of the book of John. It says, then six days before the Passover, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, 
whom he had raised from the dead. So uh, now John begins to focus on the final Passover that Christ would observe. He would keep it with his, pa- his disciples before he died. This is the Passover as originally laid out in Exodus chapter 12. And it's six days before that Passover. And John calls it the Passover, not the Passover of the Jews. In verse 3, he tells Mary, uh, uh, who's anointed his feet, uh, with, it tells us of Mary who anointed Christ's feet with the costly oil. In verses 4 through 6, it shows uh, Judas Iscariot complaining about the use of that oil on Christ's feet. And uh, verse 7 tells us that he tells uh, them that, that Mary has done this in order uh, to uh, participate in his burial. It's all geared toward that. What we see in John 12 is clearly referring to Christ's final Passover, uh, the final Passover that Christ would observe before his death and burial. And he calls it the Passover. And the timing of its observance is at the beginning of the 14th. So we're all familiar with the foot washing during that, the service. We will be having the foot washing at the, the beginning of the ceremony on uh, next Sunday night. And notice how John introduces things in chapter 13, verse 1. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Christ clearly designates this as the Passover. He doesn't call it the Passover of the Jews because this is the Passover that Christ is now going to observe with his disciples for the last time. He's going to introduce new symbols at this last Passover that will forever replace the Old Testament Passover. Now before we go to the other gospel accounts to see how Christ observed the domestic Passover with his disciples at the beginning of the 14th, let's consider a few other things that we find here in chapter 13. Let's go to verse 2, verse 2 of John 13. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. So Christ understood what was being worked out and God's great purpose in allowing it to take place. So he, it tells us that uh, supper is ended. Uh, Judas Iscariot is going to re- Re, uh, to betray him, and um, and it is this is taking place uh, during supper, not after supper had ended. But as the other gospels accounts clearly reveal, this was not just a last supper that Christ was having with his disciples. The people who observe Passover on the fifteenth will tend to say this was just a last supper, and it was anything but. It was it wasn't the last supper. It was his last Passover meal. Remember, they were, prior to the change, they were to eat a Passover meal, focusing upon sacrificing the lamb and its representation. It was his last Passover meal he was going to eat with his disciples. It wasn't a pre-Passover meal, as some will try to tell us. Uh, They were having the Passover meal itself. It was, uh, so Christ is having this last Passover meal with his disciples. And uh, the other gospel accounts make that clear. One other thing which, which uh, much is made of is, a lot is made of the word, the Greek word bread here in this, the book of John. And, uh, and uh, so what kind of bread were they eating with the Passover meal? What kind of bread was used in order to establish the bread as one of the symbols. As you think about that, let's go down to verse 21. Verse 21 of John chapter 13. It says, When Jesus had said these things, he was, was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about 
of whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And he tells him, what, it, what you're going to do, do it quickly. So the Greek word here for bread is a, a, a word that people make a lot of, that they bring this up and say, this is a, just regular old bread. And um, it does refer to that in the Greek. Uh, the Greek word for bread here is artos. And it simply means bread. It simply means bread. It's not a word that would mean unleavened bread. It's not matzo or something of that nature. It's just bread. So it, it usually refers to unleavened bread. It's a general word for bread. But it could also be used for unleavened bread. You have to look at the context to understand if it is unleavened bread or not. Uh, it's, you know, we can say pass the bread. You know, when we eat a meal, we say pass the bread. And during the un days of unleavened bread, we're not, going to have unleavened, we're not going to have leavened bread there on the table. But we can say pass the bread, can't we? Meaning those, those crackers or whatever we happen to have for uh, keeping the days of unleavened bread. But we still mean pass the bread. At that time of the year, bread is unleavened. And so it's artos, meaning bread, and it could refer to uh, leavened bread or unleavened bread. During the days of unleavened bread, in reference to unleavened bread, we could simply say, as I said, pass the, the bread, which is referring to unleavened bread. So just because John 13, verse 26 says bread doesn't prove one way or the other whether it was leavened or not. So was the bread leavened or was it unleavened? Now we tend to think of and, and do, you know, that... The bread that they're talking about here was crackers. Because that's what we're used to. It was some kind of a cracker. That's not necessarily the case. You know, for those of you who eat uh, tacos during that time of the year, you can buy corn tacos and they don't have leavening in them. Corn tortillas. And you can eat those. And uh, they're flat. And uh, so they're, they're perfectly okay for eating the day, in, during the days of unleavened bread. And they could make the same thing. They didn't necessarily have to be crackers. They could be something like a corn tortilla that has no leavening in it. And so as you had that corn tortilla, you could wrap a piece of, of the lamb that they were eating at, at, at that last Passover meal, wrap it up and dip it in the sop and give it to, or the gravy or the, the broth, and give it to... Uh, Simon is carrying. So uh, just because the word artos is used doesn't mean uh, that it was not unleavened bread. It could be a flat, malleable piece of bread that you might use for a wrap or something kind of like that. It didn't have to be a cracker. Um, most of us don't dip our crackers in the broth, uh, especially matzos. They tend to get wet and crumble, just become a sop and definitely the sop and fall apart. But you can have something like a tortilla. So how would you, if somebody said, how do you know the bread at that Passover meal was unleavened? How would you answer them? How about, let's go back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 8. See, Christ is the one who gave these instructions. He told them what they needed for the Passover and verse 8 says, chapter 12, verse 8, says, Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So what bread, what type of bread do you think they were eating there at the Passover meal? They were eating unleavened bread. You see, if Christ was following what the instructions were in Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, he was eating unleavened bread with that meal. And that bread that he dipped in the, in the sop for Judas Iscariot was unleavened. So uh, 
we can be certain of that because Christ was our Passover and because that meal that he was observing there at the beginning of the 14th was the Passover meal. And the instruction was to eat it with unleavened bread. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Let's begin to look at the, the other gospel accounts, beginning with Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. It says, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So you notice it says, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's, that's confusing. That's confusing. In uh, looking at what is happening in this in the verse we can conclude that we're not talking about the first day of unleavened bread because the Passover sacrifice was never made on the first day of unleavened bread even the Jews in the temple Passover sacrificed the lamb at the on the afternoon of the 14th didn't they now they ate it on the 15th but they did make the sacrifice on the 14th so this can't be referring to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It has to be referring to the Passover is what it's talking about here in Matthew 26, verse 17. So uh, they're, they're, it's referring to the Passover. Christ died on the Passover, I said, and uh, so it couldn't be the first day of unleavened bread. As you look at, uh, I don't know whether it, what it's like in your particular Bible, but in my New King James Version here, it says, on, now on the first... And the word day is in italics. It's not in the original. On the first of and, the, and feast of is not in there either. Now on the first of the unleavened bread. On the first of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying. That's what it, it literally means on the first uh, of the unleavens or the unleavens is is what it actually means that's what it literally says and what is meant by the first of the unleavens well the translators and the scholars look at this and say it must be the first day of unleavened bread that's that's what they're saying and it didn't mean that back then it was actually a phrase it was a phrase. Remember, the Passover and, un, and unleavened bread had been combined into one overall festival in the minds of the Jews. And only unleavened bread was used in eating the Passover on the 14th. So, in clarifying the Passover, and, and just as a clarification, we know that the Passover is not a day of unleavened bread. The pet Passover is a separate and distinct festival. But as we saw here, the bread that was there at the meal that Christ ate with his disciples was unleavened. So unleavened bread was associated with the Passover, and it was also associated with the days of unleavened bread. So Passover, where you're eating, sacrificing the lamb, roasting it, and eating it at the beginning of the 14th is and what it was called a, the first of the unleavens or unleavens. It was the first of those. And, um, by, and the, by Christ's day, Passover was called the first of the unleavens. It's not the first day of unleavened bread. It is the first of the days where it, that is associated with unleavened bread. But it is the Passover, a separate and distinct festival. So Matthew 26, 17 is obviously taking place at the end of the 13th as the 14th is about to begin. As the first of the unleavens was about to begin when they would kill and prepare the Passover lamb with unleavened bread. And remember the question to Christ is, where do you want us to prepare to eat the Passover? Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal? The, that's, we're instructed to keep in Exodus chapter 12. And it's at the beginning 
of the 14th, not the 15th. Let's look at verse 18 of Matthew 26. And he said, he said, to, said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my name is, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. He wasn't going to sacrifice, take of the lamb up to the temple and sacrifice it. He was going to keep the Passover at this house. He was keeping the domestic Passover, not at the temple. So, uh, did the, and as you look at this, the disciples don't question this. They don't say, well, wait a minute. We're supposed to be sacrificing the lamb at the temple. That's, you know, we're supposed to, we're not doing this right. Obviously, the, the disciples the, that were with him didn't question it. And the reason was they had been doing this throughout Christ's ministry. This was standing, standard operating procedure for them. This was not some unusual change. They had been keeping the Passover of Exodus 12 all the way through. Verse 19, so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve, and that evening being the beginning of the fourteenth. The example we continue to follow as we keep the New Testament Passover. Let's go to Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. Now on the first day of unleavened bread... When they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? So again, this is a confusing translation. Uh, we know that they never killed the Passover on the first day of unleavened bread. No record of that anywhere. And by anyone's reckoning, the Passover was killed on Passover day. The verse tells us that they are preparing to eat the Passover meal with Christ at the beginning of the 14th. The Greek expression translated on the first day of unleavened bread is similar to the phrase we found in Matthew 26, verse 17. And literally, the translation should be on the first of the unleavens. On the first of the unleavens. Passover and, uh, and the feast of unleavened bread were lumped together. They were all unleavens. And uh, the Passover was called the first of the unleavens. And, uh, you know, for the translators, that was difficult for them to understand. When they, when they kill the Passover, uh, they are preparing for the Passover meal, and they're doing so at the beginning of the 14th. And uh, the temple Passover is to take place the next afternoon. Let's go to verses, uh, Matthew 14, verses 13 and 14. Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the, to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? So it's clearly a domestic Passover that he was keeping he was following the instruction that he had given in Exodus 12 and continuing to follow that. There's no indication of a change. Now let's finally go to Luke chapter 22. We've looked at chapter 22, verse 1. Luke chapter 22. It talks about the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. And uh, so we've looked at that. Now let's go down to verse 7. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So is the day of unleavened bread the day on which the, the, the lamb would be killed? We know that's not true. That never happened. So it's a misunderstanding of what the wording should be. It's the day of the unleavens, the Passover day itself. The first day in which they were commanded to eat unleavened bread with the Passover meal. Also, uh, the Passover was the last opportunity to get the leaven 
out of the home. The Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke show that Christ and his disciples killed and ate the lamb at the beginning of the 14th. Let's look at verses 8, begin in verse 8. Luke 22, beginning in verse 8. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they go in and they make the preparations for the Passover. They get everything ready. And, um, and uh, they went up to this large upper room. And uh, they laid everything out. And then Christ says to them, When the hour had come, the time between sunset, Sunset and dark when the Passover was to be slain and readied. Verse 15, then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So Christ is uh, keeping the Passover of Exodus 12. He's going to establish new symbols that represent the, renew the covenant that we make with our Father and Jesus Christ. We've the covenant that we've entered into. We're reminded of that and play that out as we partake of those Passover symbols, the New Testament Passover symbols. So what Passover did Christ observe? He celebrated the Passover of Exodus 12 at the beginning of the 14th. Now let's think about something that's interesting here, one final issue. Did Christ frustrate, hinder, eliminate, and abolish the Jews' traditional afternoon sacrifice? Did he? We're going to read what happened on the afternoon of the 14th in the year that Christ died, and you can judge for yourselves. Let's first read what Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. And what Paul is addressing in Hebrews chapter 10 is the significance of the sacrifice of Christ for future sacrifices in the temple and that kind of thing. Luke chapter, or Hebrew, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, all of the sacrifices that took place in the temple and the Passover sacrifice that took place every year were shadows. They were shadows of good things to come. They were shadows of the reality to come. So the people before the sacrifice of Christ looked forward to his coming. We living on the other side of it looked back to its occurrence, to its fulfillment. They were a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things. They weren't the reality. They were pointing to a reality that would come. And they can never, with these, these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those approach perfect. They couldn't remove sin. They covered it, but they couldn't remove it. Only the ultimate sacrifice could do that. They could, they're the only way that we could be perfected. Verse 2, for, when they, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? You know, if they, were, they brought about perfection, why cease offering them? But they didn't. For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. They were to remind us of the price of sin. That the price of sin was the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission. They were a reminder of that. And they looked forward to its ultimate fulfillment. And with the coming of Christ, those things were fulfilled, those things that were a shadow. And when, so when did the Passover lambs first cease to be, feast to be offered? Were the, was the Passover lamb being offered at the temple at the time Christ died? When he literally died, were they offering up those sacrifices? There's a big, a big point is made of the sacrificing of the lambs on the afternoon. That's when Christ died and he became the Passover lamb. But the question, yes, he became the Passover. He fulfilled what those lambs signified. But he, the lamb of God, was sacrificed. But were the types sacrificed that afternoon? Were any of the lambs being sacrificed on the afternoon when Christ died as many suppose? 
Or did the sacrifice of the lambs at the temple cease to be offered on the afternoon that Christ died? Dying as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Let's look at Hebrews 10, verse 9. It says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. So Christ takes away the first that he may establish the second. We could say Christ took away the Old Testament Passover so that he could establish the New Testament or the New Covenant Passover as he did with his disciples the night before he died. Verse 10, by that will he have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, this man Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. There's no more reason to sacrifice Passover lambs once the Lamb of God was sacrificed. It's fulfilled. And we look to it, we're reminded of it, as we take the bread and the wine. The moment Jesus Christ died, all the sacrifices that were offered at the temple were fulfilled in one perfect sacrifice. And the Passover temple sacrifice on the afternoon of the 14th was never commanded by God. It was a tradition of the Jews, a tradition of men, a tradition of the Jews who rejected Christ as being the Lamb of God. They rejected him completely. They killed him. In the hours immediately preceding Christ's death, did God frustrate, hinder, and abolish the Jews' traditional temple sacrifice on the afternoon of the 14th, the time that Christ died? Let's read for ourselves what happened on the afternoon that Christ died. There were four monumental and miraculous events that took place on the afternoon that Christ died. Four monumental events. The Jews wrongly come to interpret between the evenings as between noon and sunset on the afternoon of the 14th. And they normally came to sacrifice their lambs between 3 and 5 in the afternoon. But if there were a lot of lambs, they would begin earlier. And we know that Jesus Christ died at 3 p.m. So the Jews on the day that Christ actually died could have started sacrificing as early as noon on the afternoon of the 14th. But with that in mind, let's look at the first monumental event. Let's go to Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 15, verse 25. Mark 15, verse 25. Mark 15, verse 25. It says, Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. The, the third hour uh, after sunrise, or about 9 a.m. So they put Christ on the cross around 9 a.m. in the morning. Now let's go down to verse 33. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So the sixth hour would be around noon, and the ninth hour would be around 3 p.m. So from noon until 3 p.m., there was darkness. And I'm not talking about where you can see. I'm talking about the darkness of midnight. There is no light. This caught them all by surprise. They weren't expecting this, but there was darkness from noon till 3 p.m. They weren't expecting this. They didn't have any plans to deal with this. So there's darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour or 3 p.m. And, uh, uh, re and so the noon was the earliest time that they could begin sacrificing. And from noon until 3 p.m., it's, it's pitch black dark. So you've got lambs. You've got, you're going to sacrifice them. You're going to have to get it, that all set up and have light to be able to do anything. That's all going to take time. That's all going to take effort. And, you know, an, you know animals in the dark 
is harder to deal with than animals in the light. You can't see them, they get skittish, uh, they start running around, so uh, it created some uh, chaos in the normal procedures there at that time. So why did God miraculously bring this darkness over the whole land in and around the temple beginning at noon? Could it have been, in addition to pointing to Christ as the Son of, as the Son of God, to frustrate the temple Passover sacrifices which could begin at noon? It's, as I said, it was a middle-of-the-night darkness, and it would have been extremely difficult to sacrifice the Passover lambs at the temple uh, as, they were, as was commonly done. So at the very best, this darkness over the land would, greatly, would have greatly frustrated any temple sacrifices, and it would probably have delayed or halted them for that period of time. So what happened, what monumental and miraculous event occurred at 3 p.m.? What happened at 3 p.m.? It's the time that Christ died was the time that Christ died. And as we look at the events that took place at 3 p.m., would these events have impacted the sacrificing of the lambs? Let's look at what, what happened. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. Matthew 27, verse 45. So Christ has been crucified and Christ dies at 3 p.m. Verse 45, now the sixth hour, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Christ has taken sin upon himself. He has become sin in our place. Verse 47, some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. And uh, they, you know, they give him uh, some, a sponge filled with sour wine and put it to his mouth. And uh, uh, the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Why did he cry out? Because the spear was plunged into his side, and he died. So he yielded up his, yielded up his spirit, as it says in verse 50, about uh, 3 p.m. And what happened at 3 p.m. on the afternoon of that Passover on which Christ died? Verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and rocks split. And graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So first of all, this huge veil, curtain, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and some say between 4 and 6 inches thick. It was a massive curtain held up by a huge lintel that went across there. And it was ripped from top to bottom, something that was beyond something that a human being could do. It took some uh, miraculous power to rip that veil was ripped in two from top to bottom. You had, a trim, you had an earthquake here. This was not a tremor. You know, tremor, tremor is a little shaking. We're talking a very serious earthquake of a high magnitude. You know, you start getting up into seven and eight on the Richter scale, you've got a serious earthquake which is going to do tremendous damage. And we've all seen different places in the world where you've had a sizable, a powerful earthquake and the damage that it does to buildings and cities. Things start cracking, falling apart, you know, uh, pipes break, all sorts of problems develop. And that was the type of earthquake that you're talking about here. 
Because what does it tell us? It tells us about, in, in regard to that earthquake, it says the earth quaked and the rock split in two. And the word for rock there is, means huge boulders. The power of this earthquake caused rocks to split. And if they're splitting, they're probably also falling. You know, the temple is made out of rock. And it's, it's splitting, it's falling, crashing down. Could there have been injuries? So we see that there's this earthquake and these huge boulders being split. And we see that uh, the graves were opened. Now, these were people that were dead, physical, you know, they had died the first death, physical death. They were in the grave, and they rose up out of the grave to physical life again. And the point was, this, this person who had been killed on the cross had paid the price for sin. And it was to symbolize to them that through the death of this person that men also could live again. It was, it was to represent the, the miraculous and wonderful event that was unfolding. So you have the temple being rent. You have this huge earthquake and uh, great damage being done uh, to Jerusalem and to the temple. And um, as you look at this, there may have been injuries. And if there was somebody injured, their blood spilled in the temple area, if that occurred, it made the temple defiled. The temple was unclean at that point and would have stopped everything. You couldn't have made the, the Passover sacrifices as a result of that defilement. Things would have to be cleaned and purified in order for that to go forward. There would, would, would have been a great deal of damage. Also, something interesting that took place here, this was Herod's temple. And Herod had installed in his temple two huge doors. They were 15 feet wide and 30 feet tall. And they were, uh, uh, I'm not sure of the type of uh, uh, material they were made of, but they were huge and they were heavy, and it took several men to open and close them. Well, at the time that the earthquake occurred, the doors were shut. No men opened them, but they found the doors open. They had been opened miraculously. Anyone at the temple at 3 p.m. when the veil was split in two, a violent earthquake and violent earthquake shaking the temple so violently that huge rocks were split in two, debris crashing down, and two massive doors opened on their own would have most likely have caused people to run for their lives. So who is going to offer, go in to offer sacrifices at the altar under these circumstances? You know, this is conjecture, but as you look at this, you have to wonder, well, how could they get the job done that day? It certainly made it very difficult, if not impossible. It was a frightening time. Alfred Edersheim, in the book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, says the following, that some great catastrophe betokening an impending destruction of the temple had occurred in the sanctuary about this very time is confirmed by not less than four mutually independent testimonies. Those of Tacitus, a Roman uh, historian, of Josephus, of the Talmud, and of the earliest Christian tradition. The most important of these are, of course, the Talmud and Josephus. The latter speaks of the mysterious extinction of the middle and chief light in the golden candlestick. The light went out on its own, or seemed to. It was no longer burning, which is a significant thing, a significant sign. This took place 40 years before the destruction of the temple. And both he, Josephus, that is, and the Talmud refer to a supernatural, supernatural opening by themselves of the great temple gates that had been previously closed, which was regarded as a portent of the coming destruction of the temple. With the death of Christ, there was no point to having the temple. So all this stuff that took place caused the Jews to wonder if the temple was going to be destroyed. It was an ominous sign for them. And, we can, and uh, so we can see that even the historians have seen something significant took place at this time. With all of this upheaval that took place, it's very possible that in 31 AD there were no lambs sacrificed at the temple. Really, there was no point to it. 
the ultimate sacrifice had taken place. The temple sacrifices were probably totally disrupted by the monumental and miraculous events which occurred between noon and 3 p.m. that Passover afternoon. Let's look at uh, Matthew 27 for a few, uh, a couple of verses here. Matthew 27, verse 52. As it says, the graves were opened, and coming out of the graves were those who were resurrected to physical life. In verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly. They were standing there by the body of Jesus Christ. He has just died. And they know that as that spear was plunged into his side, they were there. And all of a sudden, there's this huge earthquake. And he was in a position where he could see into the temple. And he could see that the temple curtain was ripped. The doors were opened and he could see into the temple. He could see it. And he says, um, uh, truly, this was the Son of God. He knows that something truly miraculous had taken place. And we know that something truly miraculous had. Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Based upon what happened between noon and 3 p.m., it seems that God did not intend for any lambs to be slain on that day except the true Lamb of God. In conclusion, it's very obvious from eyewitness gospel accounts which pass over God the Father and Christ sanctioned that one at the beginning of the 14th, that one that Christ celebrated as his final Passover, and that one that we celebrate as we come together for the foot washing, for the breaking of the bread and the eating of that little bite of bread and the drinking of that little cup of wine. And we can also see which one God the Father and Jesus Christ hindered and abolished. One major question remains. One major question remains. Why did God have the Passover lamb slain at the beginning of the 14th when he knew that his son would die to become the Passover lamb on the afternoon of the 14th. Why did God work it out that way? We'll answer that next week.